And now to this evening's discussion with Edward Said and Akhil Bilgrami. Dr. Bilgrami is the Johnsonian Professor of Philosophy here at Columbia and taught at University of Michigan before coming here where he has been teaching since the mid-80s. Dr. Mulgrami is the author of Belief and Meaning and has two more books coming out with Harvard University Press next year, Self-Knowledge and Resentment and Politics and the Moral Psychology of Identity, which focuses in particular on Islamic identity. Dr. Saeed is University Professor of English and Comparative Literature here at Columbia. He is the author of more than 20 books, including Orientalism, Covering Islam, and Culture and Imperialism. His most recent publications include The End of the Peace Process, Oslo and After, Reflections on Exile and Other Essays, Power, Politics, and Culture, and Parallels and Paradoxes, Explorations in Music and Society, which is co-authored with Daniel Barabon. Dr. Saeed's Freud and the Non-European will be published by Verso in April of 2003. We're very, very happy to see you all here. Thank you very much for coming. And now, Akhil Bigrami and Edward Saeed. Thank you, Jamie. Um, it's really very nice to have the chance to talk about Salman Rushdie. Uh, Edward is a good friend of his. Uh, he's been a friend of his for a long time and has many uh, common themes of interest. So it will be a very good opportunity to smoke him out on uh, some of them. Uh, I, I don't know Salman like uh, Edward does, but it's hard for an Indian, or especially an Indian with a Muslim background, not to admire him greatly and really to think of him as sort of elderly member of one's own family with that kind of affection, though he might protest the elderly. Um, <laughs> yes, get word. Edward, I thought we'd start if, uh, with me asking you to, to sort of say something about the trajectory of his writing. Uh, I know you loved Midnight's Children when it first came out and, and have been reading it, his work avidly since then, especially his novels. So, so do you want to, to start by saying something? Yeah, well, <coughs> I will. I'd be happy to. Um, I met uh, Salman Rushdie um, at somebody's house uh, in the early 80s, and I must have been about uh, 1982. Uh, I hadn't at the time read Midnight's Children, which came out two years before, but I had it, which is an important first step, obviously. <laughs> and I recall our exchange uh, was, was about that. He had read Orientalism, but I hadn't read Midnight's Children, and I said that I would do so uh, after we went home and so on. And I did, and I was uh, mightily impressed with it uh, because it struck me as the novel of a, of a man with the gifts of genius, really. First of all, linguistic gifts of a terrifyingly fertile and um, almost Joycean sort, uh, turning you know, the most humdrum things into fireworks verbal and uh, intellectual fireworks. He was also uh, you know, a man who understood and was interested in dealing with the history of his own country uh, from a perspective that I thought at the time was really quite unique. I, d I really hadn't met anybody or read anybody quite like him. That is to say, he was, a, he was an Indian who was very English at the same time. Uh, and I remember when we met, he talked about his having been a student at um, was it rugby? I mm, mean, English mm, public school, right, right, yeah. Right. And then he studied uh, Oriental studies at uh, Cambridge. And, uh, Islam was his field then. Uh, and uh, he had been in, in London for several years during the time that he was writing Midnight's Children, which I said appeared in 1980. But he had worked uh, as an actor. Uh, he had been a, um, an a, a writer of advertising copy. Which you, which you can actually see in, in some of the passages in Midnight Children and 
and some of the later novels, I mean, he's great at what you know, might be called squibs or, or uh, hmm. you know, uh, jingles, uh, which turn up obviously in the satanic verses and, and other places. And uh, was, was in, it, in his accent and manner, not the way he looked obviously, but in his accent and manner, he was extremely English, uh, at the same time that he was also unmistakably Indian. So it was a melange that fascinated yes. me, and I n never really encountered it. And I thought that Midnight's Children is the great sort of anti-epic epic of the birth of modern India after the, par after the independence uh, of uh, August 1947, with which the hero of the novel is associated. He's born on the night when the British cede India to the Indians. Uh, was a work of, of the most extraordinary uh, power and wit and insight, uh, particularly in uh, something we may come back to, in that the book is impregnated with British imperialism. I mean, that even though it's the end of imperialism, the empire sort of lives on in, in so many uh, ways in characters and rituals and memories and buildings and uh, occasions, and of course, above all, in this language, which, like Joyce and outsider, uh, Rushdie makes his own. Um, thereafter, I, I saw quite a bit of him, uh, both in, in England and in America. He, he would, he, he, he's always had a very great interest in popular culture, and particularly American popular culture. Right. You know, and uh, but his subsequent books, you know, Shame, which deals with the India-Pakistan War of the middle '60s. Um, um, satanic verses. The, uh, later, the Satanic verses. Yeah, but he also published in the middle '80s a book that was, I think, mm. very, very interesting, a collection of essays, uh, which came out just before the fatwa, which was eight, 1989. So this one must have come out '87, '88, called "Imaginary Homelands," which gives yeah. a very interesting uh, idea of his uh, essayistic scope. I mean, he he was very, very. Uh, prolific in writing reviews and appreciations and polemics, right. um, particularly about something we'll come back to probably about British racism, uh, multicultural Britain, and racism in it, uh, and what he called, I mean, a phenomenon that he identified as Raj revivalism and the return to, uh, you know, in the Jewel and the Crown and the making of the film Gandhi and things of that sort, where you look back on empire with a certain kind of sentiment, sentimental nostalgia almost. He was, he was merciless in dealing with that, but he also dealt rather prophetically with the role of writers in politics. And his biggest essay in the book is called Outside the Whale, which is a kind of rejoinder to Orwell's essay, which begins with Henry Miller called Inside the Whale. And the argument is there that there is no outside to the whale, the whale being society. Uh, that you know we're all uh, we're all involved, uh, and there's no such thing as a non-political, uninvolved writer. But if you read those words now, I mean, they have a kind of mm -hmm. eerie, you know, quality to them because in a couple of years he was going to be immersed in this terrible right. quandary. Right. And then, of course, the satanic verses appeared, and I recall very well uh, that in the mm -hmm. I wish my what, is Marion here? No. But Mariam and my wife and I spent July the 4th, uh -huh. I think it was 1987, yes. with Salman and his then second wife, an Marianne. American novelist called Marianne Wiggins. Right. They had just bought, an, it was July the 4th, yes, the weekend. And they had just bought this new house in Islington. And, you know, and Salman was very excited about July the 4th, and we had fireworks in the garden. I mean, can you believe it? It was quite, <laughs> quite funny. But I remember, I, remember, I remember with great clarity a moment that took place uh, early on in our visit, where he t took us on a tour of the house. And we went to his study. And there on his desk was sitting this gigantic manuscript, you know, like that. It was, in those days, it, it wasn't quite the period of computers. I mm. think it was all typed. Mm. And he said, this is my new novel. And I said, oh, really? What's it about? He said, it's about Islam. I said, oh, really? He said, well, I said, in a way, you know, your other novels have been about Islam, too. He said, oh, no, no, Edward, don't get me wrong. The direct quote, the Muslims are going to be very angry. I said, really? Why? He said, because I talk about Gabriel, I talk about uh, the Prophet Muhammad, and so on and so forth. He said, it's a comic novel. 
I said, oh, well, that sounds fascinating. Could I read it? He said, of course. But it was so big, I couldn't carry it. So he said, I'll send it to you. And indeed, about a week later or two weeks later, when I came back to Atlanta, uh, the book arrived at my doorstep. And I, and I had, in fact, that very valuable thing, a manuscript copy of the Satanic Verses. And then we moved that very year uh, and from one house to another. And I, I threw it away. I mean, having read no, it. No, but wait. But wait. You gave me a copy of it. I of the manuscript? Have, yeah, I actually oh, yeah. have it. So, so you, you just discarded it. I'm, I'll tell I, him. I did. I I'll did. tell him so. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But, but you know, I remember an, an occasion in your flat when you were here in Morningside Drive right. with Iqbal. Yes. And your mother was visiting from uh, DC. And, and he was telling us, Salman was there, Carol was there, and he was telling us about what was in the Satanic Verses. Oh. And I think you had received it, but you hadn't read it. No. Uh, and Iqbal said, you know, they're going to kill you. Right. And, uh, but he knew that, he that was, it would make a lot of people angry, but I don't think he realized. This is Iqbal Ahmed. The, Iqbal Ahmed, uh, who was a, a very dear friend of mine who died about three years ago, uh, four years ago, actually. Uh, and who knew, I mean, who met Salman uh, through me. Um, yeah, so yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody expected. I don't know whether you, you read it shortly thereafter. And I mean, I, I looked through it. I must confess not to have read every single word of it at that time. Mm. I did later. And I was, you know, aware, you know, of what uh, sort of dynamite was in the book. Yeah. Uh, but not, I had no idea of what was going to happen to right. the poor man. But just getting back to Midnight's Children, um, you know, it had a tremendous impact on Indian writers. I mean, this suddenly, uh, you know, all sorts of people began to write novels in that vein and with politics being very central to, to the writing and to the themes. In fact, a friend of mine, Mukul Keshavan, who's a, a, a novelist too and a scholar of uh, Islamic history, presented Rushdie with his first novel saying, uh, with an inscription saying, thanks for the four-minute mile. You know, because really it was. It was, he, it was as if he broke a barrier and then everybody started <clears throat> uh, just sort of, you know, uh, doing much the same thing and, and the different things, sort of riffs on it and so on. And to, did it have an impact on, on writers in the Middle East? No, very much so, yeah. I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think it brought home to many of them uh, the, the, the sort of combination of magic realism and nationalism mm -hmm. That was quite unique to the novel, and that, and that, you know, some of the writers. Well, I mean, the Lebanese novelist Elias Khoury, who to whom I introduced uh, Salman, or the other way around, I introduced him to Salman, mm. uh, has always found him a very interesting uh, no novelist for that reason. That is to say, mm. it's a, it's a, it's a new way of dealing with with nationalism in a way, mm -hmm. you know, a kind of irreverent, right, and yet mythic at the same time. Uh, with with tremendous sort of verve and and and, and above all something I, we must insist on with a tremendous comic sense. Yes. I mean you know the, the I mean for example that great scene where the doctor uh, examines the, the the mother of the hero through that hole in the in the sheet and and, oh, and all the business about hiding under the under the doorstep uh, under the floor of uh, you know which mm. was actually a recollection of Faz Ahmed Faz as he as he yeah. told me later. Uh, you know, is, what, what had a, a great and tonic effect on, on young, especially young writers, mm. and especially those who were li like Salman, who, who were expatriates. Right. You, know, you couldn't say that he was, at that time at any rate, an exile. I mean, he, right. he cho right. chose to live in England. Sure. You know? sure. And he had a, a, one other point, which I didn't, I found out early on, but I never read it. He wrote a novel before Mindan's Children, right. which is called Grimus. Grimus you know, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, which is a uh, you know a, a sort of an English novel and has nothing to do with India, but uh, but uh, but yeah, I think I think the 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 appearance of Midnight's Children produced a, f a whole uh, library of sort of Anglo-Indian mm. books. Right. I mean, a whole right. you know like Rowan Min Minstry and uh, right. Arundhati Roy and others who That's may have not liked him right. or but, tried to imitate him, but he certainly but, opened the way for really a, a new mode of writing. Right. And, and also, the last point, certainly a new, well not a new, but I mean a kind of jealousy. I mean he became the, the person whom everybody either tried to emulate or kill or, I mean I don't mean 
you know, actually kill, although that alas happened. Um, I think that's Marion. Yeah, um, but, but, you know, he became the figure that you had to measure yourself against for young writers. Um, and r resentments, you know, from writers who were not as well known as he, yeah. who had been around for a while, etc. Right, uh, right. So, uh, a governing theme of Midnight's Children is, is the sort of legacy of uh, colonial rule in, in India. Mm -hmm. And so, it's a lifelong theme, theme of yours. Do you, do you think uh, that Drishti gets a lot right? Uh, in Midnight's Children, that I mean, apart from the the brilliance of the writing and so on, uh, are the uh, is there a sort of perceptiveness about post-colonial? Uh, I mean, not India necessarily, but but the yes. sort of ethos, the cultural oh, ethos. Oh, very much so. I mean, I you know, I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed to talk about India, India's past, as reflected as the colonial past as reflected in something like Midnight's Children in the presence of yourself and. Nick Dirks and others who know much more about it than I do, but it, what I thought was really quite unique and, and, and ingenious about Rushdie's work was, was the sense that he gave you of the, the, of the two histories, that of uh, pre- and post-colonial India, as really in, overlapping. Mm -hmm. I mean, that they couldn't be thought of as just two separate things, right. but that one continues in the other, and, and then the other, the newer history of you know, post-47 India, right constantly is involved with and looks back to the past and that invents its own past. I mean, so that, right. so that modern India uh, invents an identity for itself that is based on, on British India. Right. Uh, I, I don't think he's particularly kind to imperialism. I mean, certainly not in his essays and, right. and other things that he writes right. at the same time. But, but there is a sense in which imperialism is part of Indian history and, mm. and can't be thought of as, you know, as a thing that ended mm. in, I mean, that I think is the point of the novel in a way, that although things began anew on August, whatever it is, 1947, right. you can't say that everything just stopped and the right. new world began. And I, I think that's the major theme, really, of the, of the kind of post-colonial world as I see it, and right. I think Midnight Children reflects as well. Yeah, you know, uh, I've always found Midnight Children uh, to be a book, actually, which is uh, very, very uh, saddening and pessimistic in a way, Just, and really sort of uh, one is distracted from that, uh, from that kind of response only by the brilliance of its writing and, the, and what, what you uh, described as the comic, the sort of unstoppable comic element from beginning to end. And the reason for that, and this is something that I wanted to ask you, really because it's so much the trajectory of um, colonized peoples and of people uh, like yours who are still colonized but who uh, one expects and hopes will cease to be um, soon, uh, that they begin their lives at midnight in, in, on independence with such great hopes. Uh, and they have futures in their minds, really, as, as you know, uh, uh, the protagonists of Midnight's Children, um, the children. And those futures, which are in their minds, never become, I mean, they become pasts before they were ever mm. in the present. Mm. You know, they, it's the, by the end of the novel. And, uh, and so I think, uh, it seems very much the, the experience of, of people of the ex-colonies, that, that independence came with, with such hopes, and nothing seems to have been redeemed in, in history. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, I think it's a, the case with his generation, which mm. is a younger one than mine. Right. I mean, there are references in the novel, as I recall, uh, not having read it in years, but I mean, there are references to modern post-independence history. For example, the Bandung period. Mm. The Suez crisis of 1956 is referred to. Uh, but that's all, you know, in a sense, part of history. And, you know, the disappointments and the, and the absence of the kind of enthusiasm that was associated with the early period with Nehru and so on right. is over. I mean, this is the period of, 
uh, of Indira uh, right. Gandhi. And, right. and I think it's a different post-colonial right. period, one with, with, without much sentimentality for the past. Right. It's not heroic. Uh, you know, Salman's novels on the whole generally t tend to be anti-heroic. Right. Uh, and there, there is a certain, I, I wouldn't call it bitterness, but there's a certain critical edge to mm. it. Mm. About, well, certainly you see it in shame. I mean, about the contemporary institutions, the military, the, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, posturing of nationalist leaders who have, in a certain, certain sense, stayed on too long. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't call it quite pessimistic the way you do, but I, I think the flush of enthusiasm, I mean, that's what the novel is about. Mm. It's about growing older. Hmm. and shedding illusions about right. you know, the, the great new dawn of, of independence that, yeah. uh, that, that you know, the character is born into on the first page. Hmm. Because there's also that famous you know, uh, exchange of babies that takes yes. place. Right. So that from its very start, history is displaced and, and must be, in a certain sense, a kind of mock history rather than an epic right. history. Right. Um, in that sense, I think it's very cleverly done. Yeah, and by, by the time he comes to shame, by the time hmm. he writes shame, that... I mean, there's hardly an appealing character in the whole novel. It's yes. just sort of, uh, and and really, it's about the the tremendous corruption uh, among power elites, especially the leaders. Mm. Mm. And you must have, uh, in in the context of being colonized. Uh, and you know, when I read your criticisms of some Palestinian leaders and so on, it, it seems so very deep seated in in. Uh, uh, and, and shame is, is a corrosive sort of look at, at that, um, yes. and that must ring very true for you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I mean, these are, uh, I mean, shame in particular is a novel really about sort of stay. I mean, it, you'll get, you'll catch the reference. It's about staying on too long. I mean, yes. people who have stayed in power too long, <laughs> and who have corrupted uh, the contem contemporary society with their, uh, with their. How should I call it? With their obsessions and with their petty uh, concerns, and and above all, with mi with militarism. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of that. Also, in my own history. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the and the history of modern Pakistan. I mean, you know, the the, the numbers of coups. Uh, yeah. You know, the emergence of a kind of um, core sort of cabal almost, which I, he's he's very good about that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. within governments. Uh, but but I, I think the difference between between Midnight Children and Shame is that I, I think Shame is a much more sober novel for yes. me. Yes, sure. And therefore yes. less less interesting, less enjoyable. I mean it doesn't have the reach and the you know tremendous energies of, of Midnight's right. Children, uh, w which is also I mean I suppose it's apt for this uh, soon to take place opening of the theater. It's very theatrical in many ways, you know, and reflects its own experience in the theater. Sure. And, and has a lot of mimicry in it and so on. And it's very much, oh, w but one important point, if I might just, mm. um, one of the interesting themes in his career during the 80s, that is to say before the, um, before the mm. fatwa, mm. 1989, was a kind of, I wouldn't call it rivalry, but there was a quiet attempt to distance himself from the other major Indian writer mm. writing in English, namely V.S. Naipaul. Mm. I mean, there's a sense, you know, in which there's a great com competition between, although uh, Rushdie is much younger than Naipaul, yes. but Naipaul was the man who, you know, who yeah. represented not sure. only, not, yeah. you know, not only the business about, you know, writing about the third world, which of course mm. Rushdie does too, uh, but, but, but also about the disillusionment, which is right. one of Salman's themes as well, yes. but, sure. but Naipaul, was, there was disillusionment and a kind of bitterness and a kind of, you know, especially in his books about travels in the Islamic world, like Among the Believers, which, yes. which Salman wrote a review of, right. uh, and, and it appears in Imaginary Homelands. That is to say, he doesn't, he doesn't take the same tone. There's still a great deal of affection and compassion in, in Rushdie's view that yes. isn't to be found in Naipaul. Right. Right. And I think what's also interesting, I mean, this is really, I shouldn't say this, but I remember once or twice, actually once here on the corner of 116th and Broadway, uh, saying that, you know, it was kind of strange that in Naipaul's writings, you know, Naipaul having written much more nonfiction than he wrote fiction, mm. you know, lots of essays on books and obviously travel and so on, he never once mentions Na uh, Rushdie at all. Yeah. He never paid no attention to him, deliberately. I mean, you can't not pay attention to Rushdie during the, during the 80s, but Naipaul did. 
And the bitterness, uh, I mean, yeah. he did not pay attention. Um, but, and the bitterness and the kind of thing, and, and the kind of um, attack on the myths about colonialism mm. by the formerly colonized mm. was a subject that, that Rushdie dealt with in an entirely different, much more, as I say, compassionate and much more humane way than Naipaul, who was yeah. always eager to deflate right. uh, the, the past and say, n not that colonialism lasted too long, it didn't last long enough. I mean, look what happened after the white man left was his theme. Right. You know, they all, and, and particularly in Naipaul's work, the kind of bitterness in, in the post-independence world, right. which, you, which you don't, I don't think, although he treats it in shame, I mean, if you look at a novel like A Bend in the River of Naipaul, you know, the kind of, you know, how, how Conrad's Africa after Lumumba and, and, and in the independence period, say, characterized by Chombe and yeah. some of the others, is really worse than under King yeah. Leopold. You don't, get, you don't get that sense in, in Rushdie, where the past is looked at, you know, with criticism, you know, the imperial yeah. past looked at with criticism, but not with a kind of, right. um, you know, acceptance and, you know, wish they had stayed a bit longer and we should have them back, etc. He makes fun of that theme, actually. Right, and, and part of that, I, th I think, is because in Naipaul's case, there's a very sort of deliberate and cultivated uh, ignorance, right? I mean, I don't, uh, about things like real history, I mean, real historical knowledge of the right. places he's writing about, right. political economies of the places he's writing about. I mean, it's a very deliberate attempt to say, I'm going to observe the surface culture and give an incisive, which he does, right. uh, sort of set of observations and right. critique of it. Yeah. Whereas somebody like Rushdie actually, for instance, in the Satanic Verses, he really studied Islamic history right. and, and it's the early period of Islam. Yeah. That's why he goes for the jugular, really, yeah. because he understands it very well right. and, and has a sympathy for the possible progressive turn it, the, it there might, might be in Islam yeah. and so on. And, and the sympathies he has for a socialist India, uh, India where uh, where the nationalism is subdued by a kind of multicultural uh, set of sympathies and so on. Those are things that emerge because he sort of understands the recent right. history. He he knows his Bandung, as you say. He knows the right. the leaders and what they stood for, where they came from, what the, and all that is whether he knows it or not. It seems almost as if he's deliberately shut it out in the case of Naipaul, Naipaul in, right. in order to... Well, not only shut it out, but I mean, he, he really writes out of a deep antipathy to Islam. I mean, the second yeah. book, yeah. I can't remember the name of it, Among the Believers was the first one, where he goes to yeah. Malaysia, Pakistan, Iran, and I think Pakistan, right. and writes these sort of devastating portraits of society, su superficial right. portraits of Iran after the Islamic Revolution and so on. And then, he, then 10 years later, he writes the same book. He goes yes. back to the same book. Right. I can't remember the name of that book. Mm. But there's a kind of visceral dislike of Islam, yes. which you don't get in, in Rushdie's book because he writes from the interior. I mean, right. for him, you know, Islam and right. Hinduism and you know, the right. religions of India, you know, a pl plurireligious right. society, are very much what he wants. Whereas in the case of Naipaul, he regrets yes. the mongrelization right. of, of, exactly. of the world, exactly. which, is, which is Salman's world and subject, right. in fact. That the world is made up of these hyphenated people, mm. you know, and, and he celebrates them, and there's a great energy in the writing he, he does. Mm. And he's very interested also, I mean, to, one has to also say that one of the books he wrote in the 80s, also before the Satanic Verses, was a book called The Jaguar Smile, mm. which I reviewed, actually, which is a book about his voyage to uh, Nicaragua. Uh, it's important to remember all these things because uh, Salman's political uh, yes. views have changed over time. Yes. To, we'll, you know, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. <laughs> no, but I mean, he was a, he went he went and he was a visitor to the to the uh, to the uh, Sandinistas. You know, he was taken yeah. around uh, and wrote very sympathetically about them and about Nicaragua as it was being attacked and. Uh, subverted by the United States, mm. you know, and, uh, and it was a, a quite, uh, I mean, it was a quite courageous book mm. to do. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it didn't, it didn't get uh, a, t a tremendous number of sales, but I think it made, a, you know, an important contribution to the struggle against empire, I right. mean, the new empire, of which he was very much, uh, you know, an opponent in those days. Yeah. Right. You know, I was thinking when you talked about Islam in that sort of mongrel sense, it's interesting that for an Indian Muslim, you know, Islam came to India via 
Persia and Turkey and Central Asia, and sort of kept acquiring sort of local accretions uh, uh, in that journey. Mm. And so it became a very much more local phenomenon, you know, uh, syncretic, continuous with, with uh, Hindu culture and, and life. Uh, and yet there was also a sort of double movement because there was this sort of deferential gaze to Arab lands and, mm. and the sort of normative and, and scriptural elements, you know, the transcendental elements of the religion, you know, was another side of it. And, and, and there's this sort of interesting double movement in, in uh, Indian Islam. And really his, the links between Midnight's Children and Satanic Verses is to actually play those two against each other. Oh, right? absolutely. Oh, right. I mean, and not only that, but I mean, they're outright, <clears throat> they're outright, uh, how shall I say, um, uh, forecastings yes. of things in the Satanic Verses in Midnight's Children. For example, the father of uh, the, the, the hero, mm. uh, I mean Sinai, yeah. the father mm. wants to be left alone in his later years. Why? Because he wants to rewrite, uh, rearrange the Quran. Right. which he says is a very badly sort of ma uh, yes. put together book. And his idea is to retire quietly to rearrange the, the book in such a way as to give it a new kind of order. Right. Well, that's a theme, you know, that comes back in the, in the, in the, in the satanic, satanic verses. verses. Yeah. 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 And the whole idea also of inventing traditions is very much the way he, 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 uh, he treats Islam, I think, in, in Midnight's Children as something that people constantly talk about and revise because precisely it's not... I mean, this is something that Naipaul attacked, whereas, whereas Rushdie, yes. you know, right. has great affection for it. It's not, in a sense, our native religion. Therefore, right. we, can, we have to give it a native face, a native right. version yes. here in India. And it's much more playful. I mean, yes. so there's, even in those, in those early books, there's a sense in which Islam is not a severe, ascetic, yes. kind of unpleasant, uh, sort of puritanical, uh, fundamentalist thing, but rather, you know, it, it, it blends quite well with some of the, you know, um, some of the aspects of Hinduism, for example, that, yes. uh, that right. you know, the, the Muslims would ordinarily not be congenial, right. uh, feel congenial about, but in this case are, are really quite attractive. Right. You know, because, and, and, and Islam is seen through that prism rather than through that of, of uh, 7th century Mecca, which, right. sure. which he parodies, of course, in the Islamic, ver uh, in the Islamic uh, verse, I mean, in the, the Satanic, Satanic verses. verses. Sorry, yeah, yeah. And yet now when, when he writes uh, about Islam, uh, th there's, there's the constant, I mean, you know, uh, now talking about Rushdi Mark II, uh, uh, there's this is constant sense you have with, with him that it's, uh, it's become a fundamentalist religion in many parts of the world. And well, it's, he's right. I mean. And it's foolish in a way. Well, but to, it's also right, yeah. And that it's foolish in a way to uh, to say things like, well, people turn to it because of genuine grievances and so on. He's much keener to say its name really is tyranny. This is just fooling ourselves. We must fight it even if with a war if necessary. Uh, Right. I, you know, can, can I just yeah. take a little time to go over that? Sure. I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying mm -hmm. in general, but because, you know, I have followed his career quite closely and at times, you know, saw quite mm -hmm. a bit of him and was involved in a very, very peripheral way in the struggle about the satanic verses. It's actually, it's, it's a very painful story, yeah. his, his, his relationship with Islam. Because we mustn't forget, for example, that in the early 90s, it must have been a year or two after the fatwa, uh, he wrote an essay which appeared in the New York Times, and which is the concluding essay in this wonderful collection of his that I referred to called mm. Imaginary Homelands. It's, it's entitled, Why I Have Become a Muslim, right. and where he converted to right. back to Islam. I think, to be honest with you, that I don't know anybody who wouldn't have had a tremendous sense of disorientation. Sure, and he was under no ordinary duress. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, <coughs> after the mm -hmm. onslaught against his book uh, when it appeared in, the, in 89. Sure. And he went through a tremendous number of phases, obviously, of confusion, of resistance, of wanting to be, you know, welcome back in, to be accepted, then of denial and anger. I, I, I never forget the year he came here when I invited him. He came 
twice, I think, but the last time he came, which was about four or five years ago, I think you were here, we, we had yeah. a conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. at the Miller yeah, Theater. Right. The first question I asked him was, of course, after he was able now to travel and whatnot, 99, I think it was. And I said to him, um, uh, Salman, do you, how, how do you feel about being a member of the Islamic ummah, you know, mm -hmm. the community? And he said, I don't feel I'm a member of it at all. It's something, you know, I hate it. It's, uh, you know, and for him, Islam was Iran at that point. You know. Right. But if you look back to his other writing, I mean, earlier writing than, than that particular right. moment, it was a much more modulated view. There was sure. a sense in which Islam exactly. was, was a complex and interesting religion with, which had many parts to it, you know, Indian and Persian and whatnot, that there was a British Islam. But then the whole thing fell on his head with the, with the, with the fatwa. And, you know, I, I, we communicated in those first few months and even years when he was in hiding most of the time. You couldn't reach him except through let's say, uh, a, a third and sometimes a fourth person. And I recall, as a matter of fact, it, I think it was in 1990. Uh, Marianne, is that, was it 1990 that we saw, that we saw? Yeah. Anyway, she's not here. Oh, there you are. Was it 1990 that we saw him? Yes, in London. He was in Heidi at the time. And uh, he was surrounded by these policemen in Scotland Yard, and you had to make the arrangements the day before, and they come. They stick, we were staying in the, houses, uh, the house of a friend who wasn't there, so they'd given us a house. And so the, the, the Scotland Yard people come the day before, and then they come an hour before mm. the appointed time, and then one of them comes in, and then he comes in and in disguise or wearing something, and the policemen were always in the house. I mean, yeah. they were on the second floor in this case. And, you know, there was, he, he looked terribly unhealthy. He was always indoors. You know, he got fat. His skin was pasty and yellow. He looked awful. And he was a man who was suffering. And as I think, I'm just now trying to uh, flesh out what it must have been like, the sense that, uh, you know, that his own people and religion had turned against him because, I mean, here they were, the, the English Pakistanis and the English Muslims were the most vehement in a way. You know, Bradford, where they burnt his book. and. Mm -hmm. He was the subject of sermons, and then all through the world, yes. the Islamic world, he was, you know, yes. so that, I think it's a very, what I'm trying to say really no, is sure. it's almost impossible to handle. I don't think anybody could have done it right. uh, yeah. any better, really. Yeah. yeah, and the lesson is that persecution doesn't make people say sensible things uh, very often. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but Edward, you know, the, here, here's my thought, and, and I'd really like to know, uh, how, let's explore this for, for, for a moment. You see, it's absolutely right. There's no gainsaying that the fact that there are uh, fundamentalist elements uh, in Islam all over, around right. us here and in the Middle East, in South Asia, uh, and so on, in Bradford. Um, but I think it's sort of ubiquitously true, nevertheless, that most people most Muslims are not like that. No, I agree with you. Uh, I agree. With you. So now, so so here is a, a thought, a question. If most people are not like that, it's still nevertheless true that, for reasons that you've written about at uh, at length and in depth, they nevertheless find it very hard to openly and strongly criticize the fundamentalists in their midst. Even though they are not fundamentalists, they oppose the fundamentalists, they can't easily come out and say so, not necessarily out of fear of the fundamentalists, because to do so would be in their own perception of things, to capitulate mm. to a whole colonial history of subjugation, of continuing subjugation in, in uh, Muslim lands. Um, uh, not in the guise of standard forms of colonialism, but new forms of... of uh, and to come out and openly be critical is, in a sense, a bind for them, because it would be as if one is just sort of capitulating to that history and to its present manifestations. Right. right? right. So, so one of the pressing questions for somebody who's so deeply interested in Islam as, as Rushdie is, mm. is how should we give these people, who are not fundamentalists, who are basically uh, either indifferent to fundamentalism or opposed to it, the confidence, right, 
to say this is not Islam, we don't have to do this and, and so on. Uh, how should they have the confidence to be able to do that? Well, it's, I think it certainly won't, they won't get the confidence if one takes the kinds of stances that Salman has now started taking. Hmm. Yeah, I think. And, right? I see your point. I see yeah. your point. Uh, I think because he's been so embattled, and because, in a way, he was trying to, um, well, to save his own life, you know, yeah. who can blame him for that? He, he wasn't perhaps as aware as, hmm. uh, as he could have been of the many people in the Muslim world who um, defended him and, and, in fact, really spoke out. I'll give you an example. In, uh, it must have been in the early 90s. He was still, you know, uh, underground. A Moroccan woman in Paris and another woman, I can't remember who she was exactly, but there were two women, decided that they would put together a book which was called in French, Pour Rushdie, mm -hmm. for Rushdie, right, right. in which they would get a hundred testimonials mm. to Rushdie from the Islamic world, mm. from prominent writers, you know, from Turkey, from West Africa, mm. from India, from the Arab world, all over the Arab world, you know, and put it together as a book uh, to show that the Islamic world was not made up essentially of fundamentalists and right. f raving fanatics and, and ayatollahs and this sort of thing. And the book appeared, I contributed to it, um, and the book appeared and it was then published in English by George Bazilla. Uh, you know, I think it may have sold five copies. Uh, no, I mean, I think it's very significant that this is a book that really was, you know, freighted with an enormous amount of significance right. for the people who took this position, which is a very unpopular, as you say, position, yeah. and, and in a sense made Rushdie's cause their cause as a way of fighting battles in their own countries, yeah, in their sure. own societies. First of all, uh, it, it immediately established the fact that Islam is not monolithic, right. you know, that it isn't just one vast bodies of people, right. you know, wearing uh, turbans and waving scimitars and saying, kill the infidel, that kind of thing. And that there were different, different Islams, right. and there were different situations in each of the cultures of Islam, in each of the countries of Islam. And that there were many people, of whom this was a symbolic right. hundred, who were willing to stand up for freedom of expression mm. and, and the freedom of the writer and you know, using aesthetics as a, a, as a means of expression against fanaticism and dogmatism and authority. Mm. Well, I mean, that, but, I mean, that hasn't been recognized. You know? mm. I'm not sure that he recognized it either. Yeah. Well, why should he? Yeah. But I mean, I'm just saying, yeah. there, there are things like that. Mm. And, that, and, that uh, uh, and, 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 and there, there has always been, you know, unlike the, the the sort of <coughs> diatribes of people like Huntington, who have tended to talk about the clash of civilizations and the clash of cultures, N there have been lots of people who have crossed from one <coughs> realm to the other, you know, including our friend Iqbal himself, you know, who is a Muslim. And myself, I'm not a Muslim. I mean, I grew up in a Muslim Surround. world, surroundings. Mm -hmm. but, but I consider it my culture. Uh, even though I happen to have been born in, in, a, in a Christian milieu, mm -hmm. but in an Islamic culture where mm -hmm. the language, the lingua franca is Arabic. Uh, and so one can live in a world like that. And of course, one also has to make the point, which he tried to, I think, in the Moor's Last Sigh, mm. in the Andalusia novel that comes right, right. after the Satanic right. Verses, right. that the culture of Islam, particularly if you look at it in, in Spain in you know, the 13th and 14th century, was a pluricultural one. Yeah. that Islam was much more tolerant than, than Europe. I happen to be reading now a book by, uh, by the Israeli writer Amos Elon mm -hmm. about the fate of the Jews in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember the title. It just came out a few mm -hmm. months ago. Mm -hmm. And I know Elon. He's, a, he's an Israeli who's very, very critical of the Israeli government and is very dis depressed about the current situation. In any case, in the early part of the book, he talks about the strictures against Jews in Europe. Mm. You know, until the French Revolution, basically. And there is simply nothing like that in the history of Islamic, uh, of the Islamic world, where Jews, of course, constituted a fairly yeah. important minority in places like Iraq and Yemen and so on, where Jews were not allowed mm -hmm. into this, were not allowed to wear shoes in mm -hmm. cities like Frankfurt, for example. Mm -hmm. Were not allowed into the main part of the city without a Christian yeah. who will come. And, I mean, the most barbaric, right. Uh, uh, persecution and invidious sort of uh, discrimination against them, you know, by, by the exactly the great enlightenment right. countries of Europe, Germany and 
France right. and, and so on and so forth. Well, I mean, some, I think some awareness of that is very important, I think. Uh, but the, the contrast with Andalusia and indeed the yeah. c c contrast with the millet system under the Ottomans. Yeah, exactly. Right? Which yeah. is, uh, uh, but uh, I think what, what, what has now happened in, in the world after 9-11 is that there, there has been you know, a kind of polarizing struggle between uh, the, the, the whole Islamic world misrepresented mm -hmm. by you know, Osama bin Laden, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you know, the world as represented by George Bush. And mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, both are equally, right. in, my, in my opinion, right. uh, are equally false, yeah. uh, you know, and, and therefore can't be taken as, as, as symbols of. Yeah. But now I want to talk about you, and, and uh, uh, I mean, wait a minute. We've Is that what we agree a, that we're going to do? <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, in these last words, you, you've been distancing yourself from some of his positions on on uh, recent political developments, and I, I just want to ask you, mm. since since you don't take that view, and I don't, and many people here, I'm sure, don't. Uh, In fact, has anybody, do you, does anybody know anybody here who is for the war at this moment? I, yes. I, I don't know. I haven't met a single person who is. But anyway, that's another subject. Go ahead. Uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry, so sorry, good. So will you please preach to the converted yeah. for the next time? Uh, uh, well, how should we sort of live and think with hope now if we don't? Um, well, I, I, I think the, the main... Hope derives from the fact that there are a lot of people who are uh, prepared to speak out against, you know, against massive wars. At the same time that they are very critical of, of uh, you know, terrorism in the name or or violence in the name of religion, but who understand, I think, at the same time that you know that that we have to live. I think the way the Europeans have come to terms with it, partly because there are so many Muslims in Europe today. I mean, they're you know the second largest religion in France today is Muslim. So, and, and, and Germany has a huge mm. number of uh, Muslims, you know, Turks and Kurds and Arabs and so on who live there, that, that, that Islam has become not some outside force as it has, has become for Americans, understandably because of 9-11, you know, this horrible sight of these planes crashing into the World Trade Center and causing such havoc and such senseless uh, suffering. Yeah, but, but even in Europe, right, the, the, the formal apparatus of democracy yes. Is completely uh, divorced. No, from yeah, the but demons. I mean, that's what I was coming to. From, I mean, from, in other words, uh, in other words, there's a sense yeah. in some parts of Europe, yeah. le leaving aside England for a moment, uh, and in parts of Europe where, yeah. where you know, where there's a, there's a there's a sense that the future has to be based upon a sense, you might say, of international community, of a kind of pluri, uh, of an integrated world in some way, which fosters coexistence. And an exchange between cultures that may not like or or accept each other, but who have to mm. live in this small mm. planet in, in in a sustainable and and humane way. I don't think that's the case here, alas. I mean, in this country, or in Italy, or, or England, or, or, or no. Yeah. Well, I mean, those governments. I mean, now, I mean, England is it's quite dramatic. It's a there's a major failure of democracy in in some of the Western democracies, including ours. I mean, right. m the po I don't care what the polls say and mm -hmm. how the questions are asked, but I, there is a major feeling of unrest in this country about the mobilization of war, which has nothing to do with, in the end, being for Saddam Hussein. Nobody's for right. Saddam, you, you know, right, sure. horror and et cetera. The same in England, when 85% when of the population is against the war. Uh, in Italy, you know, something like 90%. In Spain, 94% are against the government's position. Yeah. But what I'm talking about is how a s relatively small cabal of people, for their own purposes, that's right, that's right. I mean, have, yeah. have, really, have really mounted the barricades and are leading a ruinous crusade right. to destroy and redo the world uh, right. in, in the Middle East for uh, reasons that have nothing to do with democracy, that have to do with the preservation of, uh, of access to cheap oil, the preservation of Israel, and right. very much at the core of this, which isn't mentioned today at all in the media talking about the Middle East, 
people like Pearl and Wolfowitz yeah. and Douglas Feith and all these other people, were advisors to Netanyahu in his uh, prime ministerial uh, campaign in 1996, mm -hmm. in which they advocated the annexation of the West Bank, the end of the peace process, to stop Oslo, whatever it was doing, and to attack Iraq. And now this has become the official, seven years later, it's become the official policy of the US government. It doesn't represent the policy of the vast majority of people in this country who are ill-informed by the media and so on. And you have this sense in which the world of Islam, as I don't know who calls it that, but I mean somebody, <laughs> is this sort of, this ridiculously demonized thing. With nuclear weapons. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, we have to fight against it uh, right. with m more. Now, unfortunately, in this battle in the last few months, Salman has, to me, inexplicably turned up on the side advocating war. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll never forget it. I mean, it's not so long ago. I don't want to make it sound as if it was, you know, 40 years ago. It was about t two months ago. Mm. I, I pick up a copy of The Guardian. I, I was in England. Or, yeah. It was, I, I'll tell you exactly. It was about the 24th or 25th of January. And there was an article in The Guardian saying, who are the British hawks? And there was, of course, Tony Blair. Mm -hmm. at the top of the list, pictures of each of these people. And Michael Howard and Willie Shawcross and da 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 and Christopher Hitchens. And there, under Christopher Hitchens, or maybe above him, was a little picture of Salman Rushdie, also an advocate of the war mm -hmm. against Saddam Hussein. Well, for all the right reasons. I mean, Saddam Hussein is a terrible dictator. He's had done horrible things to his people. He's threatening the world. It's a, well, I could say the same things about Sharon, for God's sake. Or Bush. I mean, or Bush, or yeah. I mean, a, or a lot of people. But does that mean that I want to go to war? Yeah. Uh, that's what surprises me. I mean, that, there's a turn there for which I don't find really yeah. uh, evidence in his work at all. Right. Uh, and, for, and that kind of, for that kind of... Uh, yeah. Uh, and the amazing, kind of, uh, the amazing thing is that we don't even know how to theorize about the fact that these people nevertheless get re-elected and so the, the, the formal elements of democracy so don't seem to be ha have much to do with the demos, which what they're supposed to be for. Mm -hmm. And I don't think liberal democratic political theory has an account of this, that this can happen repeatedly as mm -hmm. it does in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, um, I, uh, I think we're pledged to, to raise uh, to allow the audience to, to ask you questions. Um, I know that you've been very keen on uh, actually talking about his other novels, uh, uh, The World of Rock and Roll and... No, that I, I can't talk about because I know nothing about rock what, and roll. And but what about... Fury. Well, what about love and money and sex in New York? I know you want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll open the, uh, the discussion to questions from the floor. I will uh, uh, moderate this and I will urge you uh, not to get up and make a speech, uh, but to, to put a pointed uh, and brief question. All right? Questions? Now's your chance. I took. Yes. No, I can't, I'm afraid. I, I don't know enough about what his views on Kashmir are. And you, you should well, talk about I'll, it. I'll say ju just a word. I, uh, I mean, the question should really be di directed to Edward, but, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess uh, um, my own view on this is that the US has uh, put a fair amount of pressure on Pakistan uh, to to curtail its support of militant Islamic groups in Kashmir with some success, but it has put absolutely no pressure on India to come to the negotiating table and come to a political solution on this. This is just an utterly inexplicable and unjustified asymmetrical approach. And that is because they are, uh, in the present climate, India is an ally. And India is a country in which over 2,000 Muslims were killed in the matter of 10 days, and the US government didn't say a word about it. Uh, so it doesn't look very optimistic sitting in this country. Yes? 
you please uh, elaborate on uh, Richard Crow when he advised Netanyahu in 96 about uh, the new policy? Well, there's not, I mean, that's basically it. I mean, he was part of a group uh, that um, was put together uh, to uh, help Netanyahu gain the uh, prime minister's position during the election campaign of 1996, during the period when the Oslo process had been um, supported, of course, by the Clinton administration, had been, from one point of view, going forward. Uh, you know, from the Palestinian point of view, it was a rather more complicated situation because uh, there were very few uh, concrete changes on the ground. And in fact, the immiseration of the Palestinian population under Oslo had really quite seriously taken hold. Uh, there were, this, this 96 was the year of the closures, the beginning of the closures, by the labor government of Perez at the time. Um, and the amount of land conceded to the Palestinians in the peace process had, had gone up to about maybe 12% of the West Bank and uh, about 60% of Gaza, which was never desirable by the Israelis at that time. There was a strong feeling in this country represented by people like Norman Pedaris, I mean the people on the extreme right uh, and the neoconservatives in this country, that there should be no concessions to the Palestinians at all and that the whole peace process and the whole emphasis of the Clinton administration on trying to settle the problem between the Palestinians and, the, and Israel was a, was a mistake. That what Israel should do would be to just, as I said earlier, to annex the West Bank and Gaza, to stop the discussions uh, between themselves and the, and the Palestinians, and to take a hard line on, uh, on the general situation in the Middle East. In effect, aggravating, aggravating the tension between Israel and its, its Arab, Arab and Muslim neighbors, in which, uh, you know, for example, Lebanon was thought of as you know, some, a place that should be retained. Uh, the Israeli occupation of South Lebanon was then in its um, 18th year. Uh, and they were losing a lot of uh, troops at the time, but uh, the position of the Likud at the time was that, that this should continue. And um, so the, the question was either to press forward with negotiation or to take a very hard position inside Israel and recommend that Israel basically continue the settlement policy, that it should be increased, which it was. And that, uh, that one of the, the ways of relieving pressure on Israel is, was to turn, uh, Pearl is absolutely right about this, really, that, you know, that potentially the greatest enemy for Israel in the Arab world was, was not the Palestinians from a military point of view, but, it, but Iraq, because Iraq was the, was the only country in the Middle East that was not overpopulated, that had immense resources, both oil, probably greater oil reserves in Saudi Arabia. Now it's described as the second largest proven oil reserves, but it also had water, the, the, the waters of the Tigris and the Euphrates, which was unusual in the Middle East, where if you look at the other oil producing countries like Saudi Arabia, of course they're arid, most of them are just arid desert. And desalinization is a major, uh, you know, major project. It's very costly and its results are not very uh, good because, I mean, the land is not, uh, is not fertile. And so in this memorandum that, that these people wrote for Netanyahu, which is available on the internet, you can get it, uh, they recommended all these things, including attacking Iraq which you remember Israel had done already in the early summer of 1981 when they attacked the Oziraq reactor, uh, nuclear reactor, which was supplied to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the Iraqis by France. So you can see the seeds of what's been happening now uh, already back then. And, and the position of this sort of hard right uh, group, uh, which included, as I say, Wolfowitz, it included um, Rumsfeld, uh, you know, m many of the protagonists, some of the of major figures in the current Bush administration, was, you know, pressing uh, Israel to take positions that are very similar to the positions the United States has now taken in the Middle East. It stopped the peace process. It's, it has let Sharon do what he wants in the last two years since the Second Intifada began. Uh, thousands of Palestinians have been injured, you know, 40, 50,000 major injuries of Palestinians. Many, many, many have been killed, you know, four or five times more Palestinians than Israelis have been killed. Um, and, of course, the settlements have continued. And this is U.S. policy. 
I mean, when in June of last year, Bush got up and said that Sharon is a man of peace, or was it April, I can't remember. Uh, in the, every, I mean, the world, I mean, I'm sure including Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> We're surprised. <laughs> uh, and, and these are the people whose policies now are, are, are you know, are, are, are guiding U.S. politics and, and, and military moves in the, in the Middle East. Because I, mean, I think the idea is to put Iraq out of commission. Not because it's a threat to the United States. I mean, obviously it's not. But it's a threat, a potential threat to Israel, uh, which, according to this policy, uh, must retain, you know, unquestioned dominance, military dominance over the whole Middle East. And he, he's right in another thing, that the new uh, axis of power in the Middle East would include Turkey, which has performed very well, in my opinion now, <laughs> by not going along. But the idea was Turkey, Israel, and India, instead of Pakistan, Iraq, the Gulf, and so on. And this non-Arab axis would, would assure you know, continued supplies of oil and st geostrategic dominance in this area of the world. Uh, and that's what the basis of the war, is, in my opinion, is about. It's not about the threat of Saddam Hussein. I mean, he's a deeply unpopular, horrible dictator who they supported, you know, bare 15 years ago. You know, in the last, up to the last year or so before the first, uh, second Gulf War of 1991. So, anyway, this is the transformation of policy. And if there's a war, the people who will suffer, I mean the people who have never had any responsibility, the people of Iraq who have never had any responsibility right. for the rise of Saddam, I mean the US has a responsibility for That's the rise of Saddam, they're the ones who are going to suffer. As so. Ralph Nader said the other day, we know that he has had these things because we have the receipts. In the first big report supplied by the Iraqis to Blix in the latter part of last year, of 2002, there was an appendix which was not published in this country, it was published in Europe, which listed the companies, the mostly American companies that supplied the Iraqi regime, the Ba'athi regime, with the elements of, nu of well, yes, nuclear and biological and chemical warfare. Uh, these were simply deleted from the report, which you remember the State Department said was just uh, a confection of lies and uh, yeah. Plagiarism and so on. Kanti. I would like your comments about Rushdie's writings and facts on post colonial people's characters rather than the influence as a literature and entertainment values that we all talk about, but have the people in various countries where the colonialism has finished become somewhat more cognizant and proud and, and aware of their rights in a different manner than pre-Rushdi. That's it. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I could answer that, but certainly I, you know, it's important to remember that he was one of the great champions of, uh, of sort of post-colonial people in Britain, uh, you know, in his various essays against, uh, you know, people like Enoch Powell and the racism and discrimination against Indians and West Africans. And in, in, in the satanic verses, half of it is not about Islam at all. It's it about Thatcherite Britain. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Thatcherite Britain. So he was, he, now, I, I don't know whether many people would recognize themselves, but certainly in, in, uh, in the post-colonial world would recognize themselves in, in novels like um, Midnight's Children and The Moor's Last Sigh. Uh, because obviously these are fictional characters and are you know, much more imaginative and sort of uh, playful creatures than they are supposed to be uh, portraits of actual people living today. But where I think he's uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, spot on uh, in his depictions of, uh, of, say, contemporary India, is that, in a certain way, colonialism never ended. I mean, I think that's a very important point. Mm. Uh, that it isn't, as people say, like Naipaul say, well, the, the white man has left, you know. In fact, the, the white man doesn't, there's a wonderful scene in, in Midnight Children, which I always I remember quite, uh, it's a very brilliantly done, and I can't possibly reproduce its uh, wit and, and uh, humor here, but uh, 
there's a, f uh, there's a famous estate in Bombay owned by some English people. Do you remember? They called the Meckfords or Meck... Do you, do yeah, you, Meck the Methwold, right. Breach Candy, it's called. Yeah, right. and, and, and it's sold to, the, to, the, oh, to an Indian right. family yes, by the right. Methwolds. Right. right. But they stipulate that, that everything that they did... Yes. The Indians who, who bought it have to do also. Right. So that includes having martinis and high tea at five o'clock. And there's this <laughs> hilarious scene where he comes back. My father called them Macaulay's bastards. Well, exactly. I mean, that there's a kind of slavish imitation of, of the British, which continues in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also, I, I think, another thing that he does very brilliantly is that he, he, he uh, in, in, in his literature, he depicts characters who are extremely aware of their own history. I mean, that, that, that yeah. they understand that their history is a part of their living reality. It is not something in the past. I mean, I think that's the great difference between him and, and Naipaul, because Naipaul por portrays the post-colonial person in a way in, in, in novels like Gorillas, for instance, or in his essays on, you know, on, on Eva Peron and, uh, and uh, Trinidad and so on, that these are people who are just sort of imitators of the white man, and they're to be treated with a great deal of contempt. Whereas Rushdie's characters are self-created. I mean, they are characters who, who are created out of the self-conscious acceptance of their history and who look forward to the new uh, with, a, with a rather more complex awareness of the past and of the present and, yeah. of, the, and of the new conflicts of society, such as that he explores in shame, you know, between right. India and Pakistan, between Indians and Hindus and so on and so forth. So I think, on the whole, his, his literature, I mean, the characters in his literature as they reflect the characters of the present, uh, I, I, I think are, are much more accurate, much more engaging, yeah. and much more yeah. uh, optimistic you know, than, than not, I, th I think. But right. sure. you know, I don't think no, you and, agree. And you know, Kanti, the, the minor characters in Midnight's Children are, are the sorts of characters you, you're sort of wanting us to talk about. But, the character of Mia Abdullah, for instance, who's, who's really, you know, a, a sort of low-profile equivalent of the kinds of things that Maulana Azad stood for, for instance. You know, Muslims who believed in a composite culture, and, and there, there's something very touching about Rushdie's sort of understanding of that and sort of smuggling them into the narrative in those ways, the magicians mm. and, and their sort of... Uh, social sympathies and so on, which are so removed from, you know, Indira Gandhi and characters like that. Uh, so, but you're absolutely right to, to raise a question about characters like that, because it's really what makes the novel such an affectionate book on Bombay and India. So, yeah, the back there. Can you tell, um, can either of you tell us if any of Rushdie's work has been translated into um, either Urdu or Hindi or any of the Indian languages or Arabic? Oh, oh yes, yes, there are any number of translations of in Hindi and Urdu and Arabic too, I assume. Not satanic verses, probably. Yeah, I think Midnight Children was published in Arabic. Uh, and, and the La yes, Shame was too. Uh, and then, no. No, of course not. He wouldn't be published in that. Well, the, when he came and spoke here, when you invited him, he was rather annoyed about pirated translations and editions of it available all over the uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, yeah, there was a question. Yeah, the back? And then I, I think, sorry, this is, uh, isn't quite immediately related to the question of translation, but it, you mustn't forget that in um, about two years ago, he went back to India after the whole uh, fatwa Thing and wrote a long piece for the New Yorker about yeah. his return to India with his son. Right. So he, I mean, he can go to India, and, uh, and although the filming of Midnight's Children, which was sort of been done on yeah. British television, I remember him talking to me. But he won it. a legal case and got his house. Which he, he got his house, exactly, in, but in they wouldn't allow them to film there. And right. then they, they got permission to do it in Sri Lanka, and that was also yeah. taken away. I mean, it was felt that, you know, his, the presence of, you know, for a big project like that, yeah. associated with Richley in countries, with, with large Muslim populations was still, it was still a bit... Yeah, but Bruce is redeeming all that over here in the Apollo Theater, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm taking us back to Naipaul only because you brought him up a couple of times. 
And one of the things that occurs to me is this notion that Naipaul, um, there, there's a recent article, I think it was in the New Yorker, about Naipaul's whole upbringing in the West Indies and his relationship to class, um, being Indian, Indianness in a society which was black and white, and blackness as, a, as the other, and all of these things playing into his portrayal of West Indianness and colonialism. Whereas Rushdie, I think, never went through those kinds of um, uh, being, as it were, and that would partially probably account for his being far more comfortable with the kind of multiculturalism that he's advocating. What do you think of that? I'm really particularly thinking of this recent essay in the New Yorker. Which I haven't read. I'm sorry, know. and I can't remember who wrote Hilton it. It's Owls. very interesting. Hil Hilton Owls wrote it. I, I, I made a note of it, but I haven't read it, in fact. I think you're, you're probably right, but I think it's also a matter of temperament. I can't, yeah, I mean, I think, I think Naipaul's feeling about the world in general, I, I've only met him once at a Conrad conference many years ago. He was, he was, he's a great, uh, you know, fan of Conrad's. But, and, and of course, I've, of course, one has seen him on television and so on and so forth, but he, he's a much more, um, I think, um, abrasive and, and um, uh, how should I put it, he's a much more judgmental writer, I think, than, uh, than, than Rushdie yeah. is. Rush, I mean, and his style is much more ascetic. It's a much more um, pared down and, you know, kind of English style in the, in the classical sense of the word than yes. Rushdie's, which is tumultuous and right. turbulent and full of importations and full of slang. And full of vernacular. Vernacular, idiots. yeah, and slang and lots of, I mean, no, it's a t they're totally different personalities. Mm -hmm. So, you could say that maybe uh, Naipaul's upbringing was r rather more challenging and more, I don't know, but uh, that difficult can't exactly than Rushdie's, but that doesn't explain it, I think, because I think, I think at, at heart, just the last point, I think at heart, Naipaul is, is much, much more conservative. And, you know, his feelings about modernity are, are, are deeply uh, ambivalent. Whereas uh, my impression, in general, of Rushdie's writings are that, uh, that modernity and I mean, he's a, he's a postmodern novelist. He's really full of, you know, of uh, energy and uh, newness and oldness sort of mixed up together. He's not, he doesn't care so much about uh, the proper way of doing things. In fact, most of his novels are really parodies of that. Uh, and so that there's a whole difference between the two of them. And as I said, I think Naipaul's feeling about colonialism is much more forgiving and, and much more uh, tolerant. And, and he's very, 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 um, he's very severe with, with the emanations of, in the world after. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, in a novel like Bend in the River, he's merciless uh, about what is today, the present day Congo, really, you know. And, and very little is said about the depredations of, of King Leopold's rule, which was horrendous. I mean, you know, millions of people were killed. And that, forever distorts the country, uh, as Congo has been. Uh, Conrad understood it much better than Naipaul did, I think. Yeah, it doesn't explain it, but it isn't also entirely true, because, uh, because Rushdie talks about the terrible time he had at rugby and so on, and with similar sorts of experience, maybe not the same scale. Uh, yeah? you could sort of view as a quasi-position paper for the current Bush administration. I was wondering if you could talk about that in terms of, or maybe in relation to um, some of his previous writings, I'm thinking more specifically of The Moor's Last Side, when he really just viciously lampoons Hindu nationalism and that sort of rise that has a very similar ideology, I guess currently, of a very sort of anti-Islam ideology and how sort of those conflict or, or yeah, I mean, I, I, I really can't uh, talk about the paper he wrote in the Times shortly after September 11th. Uh, I, I read it, uh, but I can't remember it. I'm sorry. Uh, but, I, but I do remember one that came later, in which, which I think the title, maybe a year after that, in which he, he writes an essay in the Times, which is called Islam is the Problem, I think, something like that. And then his, his view is that... Uh, you know, which I think is it's true, I agree with it, that, is, that in large areas of the Islamic world, Islam has been captured. 
by you know the worst elements of uh, of, of dogmatism and uh, fanaticism and uh, you know uh, kind of an absence of tolerance and so on and so forth. But what I I mean I don't disagree with that you know but I but I but again I, as I said earlier I don't think he pays enough attention to the varieties of Islam. I mean he, it's a much more monolithic view of it than than I would uh, volunteer. Uh, that's number one. And number two, it's quite invidious because he doesn't talk about the other monotheistic fundamentalists and crazies that populate this world. Not all of them are Muslim. I mean, there are Christian fundamentalists, who, one of whom is our president. You must no, I'm, ser I'm really quite serious about this. These are people who are at least, I mean, people who don't believe in evolution, for example. I mean, there's a lot made about the schools in places like Saudi Arabia and the madrasas, as they call them, in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, which are deplorable. He's but a, I mean, there are places a, in this country where you still can't teach. I mean, where it's a, it's a legal issue as to whether you can teach Darwinism. You, can, you can't teach evolution. It's not surprising. And the creationism has a very strong uh, constituency. And, and the same, I'm sorry, just one last point. Uh, and the same is true of Judaism. I mean, there's a lot of fanaticism in Judaism today. And the people who go around killing Palestinians on the West Bank, I mean, I've had experiences of this where people, I've seen uh, Israeli soldiers and, and settlers taking over Palestinian lands and bulldozing the farm, just wiping out the work of, fa of families who live off the land. And when I asked them about this, this is not their land, he told me, the Israeli soldier in 1998. I said, whose land is it? He says, it's the land of the people of Israel. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, so what about that? I mean, I think the phenomenon, the monotheistic, well, and I suppose the Hindu nationalist too, all of this kind of fundamentalism, in my opinion, has to be treated together. That these are sick creeds that feed off each other, but to single out one and say, the problems are all there, is, is I think, terrible. I think one really has to be, and, and that's where I feel, you know, Salman hasn't really been forceful enough in, in, in talking about this. Uh, that, that all of these religious, uh, I mean, the politics of, of religion, of, and especially of religious fanaticism, are really dependent on each other and, yeah. and really have to be dealt with and opposed together, not you say, well, we want to oppose this and not that. Uh, I couldn't resist saying that it's not surprising that Bush doesn't believe in evolution. He's a living instance of its falsity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I just wanted to, to say um, one thing. You're absolutely right to point out that the Moors Last Sigh is, oh, is, uh, is tremendously critical of, of Hindu fundamentalism. Uh, so there's a sense in which he is a little even-handed uh, when, when uh, it comes to that. But No, I was just talking, sorry, I was just talking about his writing after 9-11. In, in the non-fiction. Non yes. uh, but, but, you know, really it does seem to me that it's not as if he is not seeing, I mean, he's against religious fanaticism of any kind, but what he needs to focus on is the kind of Muslim who is going to possibly believe what he's saying. And that kind of Muslim is not going to believe what he's saying if he or she is constantly having to fight off wars, fight off talk about how they don't believe in modernity and freedom and so on and so forth, right? right? And, and he's playing into that by supporting this war and, and so on. So it's not as if he's not even handed, he just hasn't, he's confused about what his own targets are and how to hit them or approach them. I think there's a, there's a just one more point about this. I think there's a, in my opinion, there's a greater disconnect or disparity between his prose, non-fictional prose and his fiction now than there was during the period of the, you know, of the, mm. the decade of the 80s, which produced Midnight Sugar and Shame and the Jaguar Smile. Uh, and, and now I think he's caught up in, in a world of, uh, you know, much, much greater media uh, magnification. And of course, he's become a great celebrity. There's no question, he's probably the most famous writer in the world. Uh, and he went through a harrowing experience during the years he was in hiding and, and sought out to be killed, uh, uh, you know, during those four or five years when he was underground. And, you know, 
persecuted and unable to travel really. You know, the, the, I, I remember when he came here actually in 19, whatever it was, 1998 or 1999, mm. uh, he told me that British Airways would still not take him on a plane. I mean, he, he had to come on some other airline. I mean, coming from London, that would, you know, one of the logical things would be to take British Airways, but they wouldn't, they still wouldn't take him. Iran Air, I think. <laughs> you know. But he had to come on another air. So that kind of thing, I think, in the end, uh, you know, uh, Ch changes and perhaps confuses, as you say, the individual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we spoke about, about the writers who be influenced. Um, how would you say that he, he continued the tradition set forth by Gabriel Garcia Marquez of magical realism and national allegory? How does he what? Oh. <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, what was the uh, um, you how would, you've, you've spoken about who he influenced with his writing. How, um, how, how would you say that he reacted to his influences? People have uh, shown parallels between Midnight's Children and 100 Years of Solitude. And like Good to grasp. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, I mean, he, he's written about it in the people who influenced him. I mean, Kafka, I think, is one. Uh, Nabokov is another. Calvino is, is another. Marquez, you mentioned. But for example, there's, there's a great deal of appreciation in him for writers who are more conventional than he is, but who treat similar themes of displacement and uh, uh, discrimination. Uh, Nadine Gordon, uh, he, he wrote a very appreciative essay about her, a collection of her short stories that I recall quite well. Um, and in general, he seems to be very interested in novelists who are like him you know, migratory, who, who are, you know, like the South African writers in exile during that period. Uh, Kundera, you know, an, an East European writer, also in exile living in Paris. I mean, transplanted, expatriate, and, and so on. I mean, those are the people who mean a great deal to him. And I, I have to say it, I mean, it's, it's because it's, it was very flattering to me. He wrote very well about some of my work, and uh, I mean, it made a great difference to me that he did. Um, uh, yeah, about, for example, my book on uh, the, uh, After the Last Sky, which he and mm. I did a yeah. dialogue yeah. about in, at the ICA in London, which is published also in Imaginary Homelands. And then in his latest book, whose name I can't remember, a collection also of essays published by uh, Random House, there's a, there's a very terrific essay by him on my book of, of memoirs, after, uh, <clears throat> Out of Place. So I, I think he has a very sharp eye for people that he can identify with in the modern world. And they are, in many ways, you know, share a similar fate, perhaps, you know, which is that of being not at home, uh, but abroad. Yeah. What's the time? Dr. Sayed, as someone who studied um, Islam for many, many years, I was hoping you could enlighten sort of Muslims that are in this room as well as elsewhere about these two questions that I have. Um, the first is, what do you see as the sort of the future of Islam in the West in a post-9-11 environment when we see Islam being polarized in very two opposite ways, especially here in the West? And the second question was, how can Muslims create and proliferate a progressive and pluralist division of Islam that respects basic human rights and a culture of democracy in the Muslim world. Well, it's not going to be done by America, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, I, I, my view is, first of all, I'm not an expert on Islam. I mean, that's a kind of r ridiculous oversimplification. Um, and I, I don't, you know, uh, myself have any uh, particularly expert knowledge of, of it as such, but, but what has always impressed me is that it seems to be much more diverse and much more complex in its manifestations than, than similar. I mean, so I, I find it very difficult to talk about the world of Islam, which is what often comes up in the, in the, in the, in, and I, I'm much happier with, uh, you know, political and historical um, experiences that have occurred in, to Muslims in, in countries that have large Muslim populations or majorities. Um, and I, I, think, I think it's also true to say that, you know, words that have become highly demagogic, like, well, leaving aside the main one, which is terrorism, uh, for which no one has found an answer, except that it's always associated with Islam. But 
I mean, most of the discussions that take place today about the word terrorism, I mean, there was a big debate in the United Nations during the 70s trying to define terrorism, and they failed. They just were unable to do it. Nobody could agree on it. One of the reasons being is that terrorism is always associated now with non-state apparatuses, you know, individual groups like bin Laden, Qaeda, etc. And there, I think there's a very important component of state terrorism, which is simply never talked about, that states perform acts of terrorism. Uh, I mean, the modern world, I mean, look at, look at Germany. Uh, you could describe all of that as uh, state terrorism in, in, the, in the Nazi period. In any, in any event, what I, what I wanted to say was um, uh, th this, uh, uh, the, the vocabulary uh, of describing Muslims and talking about moderates and modern and modernizing, you know, this kind of rubbish that somebody like Thomas Friedman trades in. You know, they have to reform, and you know, I, I just find it inconceivable that anybody could talk about a, as vast a phenomenon as this with as little knowledge. First of all, before you can talk about the whole world of Islam in these general ways, you have to know the languages, and he's, he's never demonstrated, people like him, I mean, have never demonstrated that they have any knowledge of what takes place, I mean, immediate knowledge of what takes place in universities and so on, and schools all, all over the Islamic world. And second, and most important, who says that the, that the modernizing trend is set by the West? I mean, because that, uh, you know, that would include having to pass through the experience of genocide, you know, which, is, which is not one of the happier ex, uh, experiments or, or results of, of modernization. I mean, modernization is, is not an you know, adequate yardstick. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there was that wonderful exchange between Muhammad Ali, the boxer, Mm -hmm. uh, Ali, as they call him mm -hmm. here, uh, and, uh, and uh, somebody down at the World Trade Center after 9-11, mm. when he said, uh, the guy said to Muhammad Ali, he said, how does it feel to the religion that did this? And he said, how does it feel to, the relig uh, to be a member of the religion that brought us Hitler? I mean, so you can play that game, you know, and, and come out with absolutely ridiculous results. Uh, but uh, but I, what I'm trying to say is, in fact, that uh, if you take off all of these labels and these phony counters like democracy and modernization and so on and so forth, you'll find that there is dynamism and change taking place everywhere. And that I've written about this. And I think one ought to be able to regard uh, cultures as going through a period of, uh, of trying to de define themselves. I mean, I think that's really the major phenomenon of the present period that we're passing through, whether in Islam or in the West or elsewhere. That that there's been such a seismic change, not because of the end of the Cold War, although that's important enough, and not because of the nuclear and the technological revolutions and all of that stuff, but because of immigration, but because of the vast movements of populations, that the nature of a national identity has changed so much that all of these countries, like Germany, like Pakistan, which is a relatively new country, like Israel, like America, uh, are going through processes of self-definitions which, which, are, which are not over yet and which will, are beginning to redefine the terms of how we think about the past, how we think about the present, how we study history, what history do we study. Every major culture, every major society and minor society on earth is going through that period now. And I think that's the way to look at it and not to use the invidious terms and say, well, they're backward and they are really pre-modern and they haven't quite achieved this and we are, the mo we are going to, in the manner of Rumsfeld and the others, well, we're going to bring democracy there. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't import these things from the outside or if you do, you cause a lot of damage, I think. Thanks a lot, Edward. Edward Said. Mm -hmm.